has skyrocketed on the back of meme coin madness. Not usually the topic to discuss on a day like Macro Monday, but many people point to this as an example of the froth that can happen in the crypto market and could, could signal at least a local top. I want to discuss that with Dave Weisberger, Mike McGlone, James Lavish. We're also obviously going to talk about macro, liquidity, gold, Bitcoin, everything else you guys have come to expect from us. It's Macro Monday, my favorite day of the week. Let's go. Let's go. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, also known as the Wolf of All Streets. Before we get started, please subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. Going to go ahead and bring on Dave live from the Digital Asset Summit in London. James, super early morning. And Mike, you're on my time zone, so we don't get any uh, special accolades for being here at 9 a.m. Guys, listen, the, the title here, Solana Skyrockets. For those who don't understand, meme coin madness is happening. It's absolute insanity. And... It's mostly happening on Solana, which means people need to buy Solana to buy these meme coins. Price of Solana goes up, approaching an all-time high. But guys, this level of froth we're seeing here is insane. I just saw this tweet. Dude raised 30 million pre-sale in under 30 minutes by listing an address on social media. Gary Gensler doesn't understand the power of apes. Then I clicked on the tweet and it's already been deleted. So probably an exit scam for $30 million in a matter of minutes. This guy literally said... Okay, I'm selling 20% pre-sale on this token. Here's a Solana address. Send your coins. I'll send you money back. $30 million in a matter of minutes. What is this a sign of that's happening in this market? Mike, I know you love these things. Oh, man, you don't want my condescending view. You already nailed it. This is classic signs of speculative access. And it's one thing, man, I, I like how Dave says it sometimes, be careful with leverage. And James mentions that too. But I come from that environment. I was born and raised, raised in leverage and futures is typically 20 to 1. You just stop yourself out and hope you don't get stopped, uh, run through your stops and, and stuff like that. But it's the, the key thing I think there is it's example of the massive speculative access as you're seeing in there's Bitcoin and then there's 30,000 wannabes. And then of course, the, the, the fact is that I, I think it's all indicative of the macro big picture. I still look at cryptos as a great leading indicator, particularly Bitcoin. It's also indi indicative to me that, yeah, what, if you're the Fed and you see this big uptick in, in the stock market and the massive speculative frenzy in, in cryptos and inflation upticking, well above your targets do you ease that environment and that's what i'm kind of like why would they consider that it's just spiking that so i can tilt over to some of the stuff from our meeting this week but to me that's the key thing and i also have a few things i'm going to tee uh, key james off and because on a global basis the stuff from my view from a commodities is clearly still towards recession let's just uh let's circle up on the on the meme coins and what it means dave then james and then we'll go to your morning meeting mike and we can, can uh, continue from there so if you yeah. want to know what's happening, I, I, I watched the movie on the plane over uh, to England, and it's literally a perfect analog for what we're seeing with meme coins. It's the Beanie Baby movie, Beanie Baby movie, <laughs> starring Zach Galifianakis uh, and Elizabeth Banks, and it was brilliant. It was a really good movie, and the funniest part about the movie is it most of what mattered or what was said in the movie, the craziest shit, was all true. And you have you have what is a speculative frenzy for something that the only reason it mattered is because other people wanted it. And so what's happening with meme coins is no different than Beanie Babies. Now, will they go to zero or will ultimately some of these things be considered status symbols like a Birkin bag? I, I don't see how. I, my brain doesn't comprehend it. I mean, to me, the ultimate irony is how Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler have effectively created this. And yes, I said Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler have created this. Let me repeat it for a third time. They, who like to criticize and protect investors, have created the meme coin craze because instead of building a community which has some ability for the people in the community to monetize that community, participate in the economics, create something where you can create something around it all of these meme coins share one common characteristic they all say we don't have any revenue we don't have any monetization we don't have anything 
that could make us be called a security. We are just for fun. And once you do that, it doesn't change the fact that people are going to speculate in it, but it does mean that it's probably going to end in tears because eventually, like Beanie Babies, they're going to die out. So they have gone to the point of creating rules where you can't create a community, incentivize it to one where you can have a community and have fun, but you can't participate in the economics. And to me, that is the ultimate irony. And if I want people listening to your show to hear anything, there's nothing to do with Macro Monday, but it is a very important point. Why are our regulators, why do they all deserve to be voted out of office? Why should John Deaton beat Elizabeth Warren? Why should we be looking to get rid of Sherrod Brown and and you know Brad Sherman and you know what what's his name Jack Reed who I guess he he's not up for election in this cycle because they're forcing the regulators to avoid any sort of disclosures so there's no way for people to know that these things have no economics most people buying this stuff is like they're buying it because they think it's going to go higher but they have no idea that it's a game of musical chairs so when the music stops it eh, that's it. Send $30 million dollars to an anonymous Twitter account with just an address with zero guarantee, signature, nothing. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, it's just because they expect it might go up. Go ahead, James. Yeah, well, it's clearly the afternoon where Dave is. So <laughs> his mind is clocking at a different rate than us. So um, <laughs> look, I, the, the memes, I mean, these are meme stocks. I mean, what do you, what, what else is there to say? So as far as the as far as the Fed's concerned, it's interesting. I was uh, I turned on Bloomberg this morning, and um, and I don't know if you saw it, Mike, but Claudia Sam was on there, and they were uh, they were interviewing they were interviewing her and, and asking her what she thought the Fed's kind of stance was, where they are, and she uh, pointed to a couple of data points that are that are interesting. You know, she refuses to. Um, well, she was adamant that the retail sales numbers, the recent retail sales numbers were pretty much abysmal. Um, and then, and pointing to the uh, the CPI numbers and the, the inflation numbers, the stickiest part in there is are, are you know, there are aspects that the, the Fed can't do anything about, like um, inflation on uh, on car insurance. And that's because of, you know, the, the rise in the, the sales price of used cars. And the maintenance on them that's not going away that's that's super sticky stuff and so her point is that the you know, we're, we're going to listen to the fed and hear what they have to say uh this week and and surprisingly powell's been pretty quiet i think it's uh and it's got the markets not spooked but just wondering are we going to get three cuts we get four cuts it's going to come in june it's going to come in july and i, I want to hear what mike has to say and and how he's teaming me up on this but you know, I mean, they're they're in a spot here where they want to lower rates. You've got conflicting data. You've got some really kind of crummy data that we we revise and revise and revise and revise. And so it's it's really difficult to see what's going on, especially as as these numbers come in and they're they're so they're already lagging, and then the revision is lagging. So um, you know, again, the Fed just they're they're not looking at these meme stocks. They're not looking at the I don't think they're looking at this the crypto market and and taking into consideration pretty much at all. I think they're just, you know, the only consideration they'll have is if the if the stock market crashes, then then that matters to them um, because it will impact the treasury market effectively, and that's that's the only thing that really matters to them in my mind. So, but uh, yeah, that's kind of where my headspace is early this morning on Monday. I just really quickly, you know, I just did see this article last week, JP Morgan, Bitcoin surge could raise concerns that the Fed rate cuts might be delayed, right? So now they're saying actually that uh, JP Morgan saying Bitcoin could be the cause. Of these Absolutely ridiculous. Are delayed, right? so, yeah, Absolutely delayed. ridiculous. Yeah. No. That's so funny. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I did. I did. Um, I, I I agree with your disagreement, but I did point out. I like pointed out a couple of years ago. Pointed out how Bitcoin as a leading indicator has been good. Sometimes give you those little indications for what to expect from the Fed, and um, you know it's it's and almost end of the Q1 and S and P 500, Bitcoin, and all goal have all made new highs this quarter. Are just kind of hovering within that area with little profit taking and stuff. So, the question is, where do we go from here? So, just the key thing is, it's all about the dot plots this week. And um, Anna Wong, our chief economist, expects they're going to stick with the uh, um, 75. It's a question between 75 and um, 50. Um, she thinks Paul might um, surprise on the dovish side. I, I think why? 
<laughs> and the key thing is the labor market's just getting weak. Is it for the Psalm world? You know, wake, labor market's up only five tenths from the low. It's kicking higher. Is it getting help from the Fed? No, not yet. Um, the key thing I also enjoyed from our equity strategies, Gina Martin Adams, she pointed out the biggest risk to stocks is inflation. And I like to point out, well, that's the problem right now. Just like what commodities did two years ago, they're their own high price cure. Every single time you see that stock market goes up, inflation's picking up, copper's kind of coming up a little bit, crude oil's kind of coming a little bit, up a little bit, and Fed rate cut expectations are dropping. And I look at it as, you're the Fed. Your targets right now are double your your um, inflation. I mean, inflation, their measures are double their targets. They're upticking as the stock market goes up, as Powell probably pivoted a little too early. What's your risk? Ease early and do the same same thing he's been trying and pointing out for the last two years that doesn't want to, he wants to avoid those risks of inflation. So I look at this as a silly situation where the Fed might say it, but one thing that Scott's been on top of for a while, every single time we've priced for these eases, since we started pricing for 100 basis points of easing at the beginning of 23, the Fed raised 100 basis points um, last year. It's like, I, I'm loving this. But the key thing I wanted to point out is I um, just finished my gold deck. I, I just compared gold versus everything. From a commodity guy, it's the only one that goes up basically over time. And the thing is, the world's changed so much that um, you can't have gold anymore without Bitcoin and space. It's just a fact, unless you want to take risks. But the one thing I want to tee off you and my colleagues on is, I've been comparing lately how people keep saying U.S. bond yields are going to go up, and I've been comparing them to, well, okay, you're getting 100 basis points less in Germany, well, 200 in Germany, in Greece and Canada, 200 basis points less in China, and even in India, it's not that much higher. So I did, lately, I just did a, a metric. I compare um, the, the four top um, GDP countries in the world behind the U.S., if you just take the average of their 10-year note yields. I mean, this is one of a bond guy. I always think bond guys tell the truth. The average right now is 115 basis points below the U.S. So that's an indicative where the world's going. Is the rest of the world's got a big problem if the bond market's telling you something. That's deflationary, disinflationary trends, and the market's just what you'd expect after the cycle we've had up to that peak. In, in money supply. It's all tilting that way. The U.S. is the only one accepted, but the difference right now in yields between those four countries and the U.S. is about 115 base points. The U.S. is that much higher. So I look at it as we have a completely inordinate burden on this U.S. stock market to keep going up. We haven't had a 10% correction since the low in October. We've only been down one week, one, I mean, one over 1%. And I look at it as, okay, I still stick with that view that from a, a risk management standpoint, someone who's running hot money, you get your value at risk model, you it did really well catching this rally. And now I think most smart man, money managers are pulling back and waiting for that next opportunity because this rally in the equity market is somewhat parabolic, but it's without corrections. Bitcoin's had a correction, gold's had a correction, and it's just, if I, I look at it as Dave will agree, but beta has a little correction, everything has a problem. That's why I'm just kind of waiting for that test. Can we get through that year without a test? That would be wonderful, but that would be very rare. So the key thing I want to tee James off on is this fact that virtually the rest of the world in terms of bond yields is in a recession, most notably compared to the US. Yeah, well, that's, then that's a great point. And so we've been talking about a little bit, and I wrote about this weekend just to kind of get my uh, readers on my newsletter to understand the difference between these things. But, um, you know, we have an issue between fiscal and monetary policy. And so you are seeing, and there's no denying that there are pockets of recession in America. There are, there are areas of our economy that are struggling. You're seeing layoffs. You're seeing uh, margins being squeezed. Uh, you know anything that's really interest rate sensitive. We all know that that commercial real estate is super interest rate uh, sensitive, and they have they have a major issue. Uh, you know any any companies that are they are high leverage that that have uh, borrowing that's on variable interest rates. Those they're, they're struggling. And so you are seeing those layoffs. You are seeing the economy kind of grind in, in these areas, especially in some of the consumer areas. Now you're seeing, like uh, Claudia Sam said this morning in the retail side, look, the, in, the individual consumer has been, they've been piling on credit card debt just to keep up with the rising prices, you know? And so, yeah. And so in that, in that newsletter there, I'm, I'm talking about how you've got the feds got, they've got two main tools. Right. The, the two main tools are to control the interest rate or the, the target rate and uh, QE or QT, which is managing the, the uh, their balance sheet. And so they've been letting 
uh, bonds kind of mature off their books and they haven't really been actively selling, but they've been letting, letting bonds mature off their books, which is that, that takes liquidity out of the market. They raise the cost of capital that takes liquidity out of the market. But on the other side, what is completely overwhelming this and you're seeing pockets of expansion, especially in infrastructure spending, in the green energy spending because of the, the so-called uh, you know Inflation Reduction Act and, and the spending coming out of Washington, we're running $2 trillion deficits. That's 7% of GDP. So that right there, go to that next chart there, uh, Scott, right there. That's our inflation rate. And you can see it's kind of stopped out. It's kind of gotten sticky here above 3%, somewhere between 3 and 4% that they admit to is where it, it's it, the, the inflation is kind of bottomed out. And that's because of all the spending that's coming out of Washington. It's a massive amount of, of liquidity and, and it's just, it's stimulus coming out of Washington. So now you're seeing pockets of expansion versus pockets of recession. And so to Mike's point, yeah, we are we are experiencing recession because of uh, because of the the Fed monetary policy in areas, but in other areas, the, people are not experiencing it at all. So when you go out to restaurants, you see a bunch of boomers in restaurants. You know, they're older people. They're just spending and spending and spending and spending. They've got all this money. Why? Because they retired in in the pandemic. They're sick of it. They're like, I'm out. I don't need. I'm going to start collecting my benefits. I've got Social Security. Medicare, Medicaid on top of my pension, on top of my house that's uh, that's up, you know, 90% in, in just a few years. I'm good. I'm I'm just going to, you know, spend until it's gone and my kids can figure it out themselves. And, you know, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of the it, it you're seeing a difference between you've got millennials and Gen Z's who are like, I'm working this job. I can't pay for my rent. I can't pay for my car. I can't pay for a cup of coffee versus the 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 older demographic which is like i don't know what everybody's complaining about life is good you know so it, it's there's there you have two different economies within america right now and that's kind of what everybody is is sensing from a hundred you know thousand foot view that's what people are sensing and the white house is gaslighting you and saying inflation's coming down it's not coming down prices are not coming down and then you've got, you know, uh, the Treasury is just spending and spending and spending and spending. So it is by far the, 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 the most perverse thing I've seen yet come out of Washington to spend to have 7 percent GDP or 6 to 7 percent of GDP, um, you know, deficits at a time when that the economy across the board isn't hasn't even really officially ticked into recession. It's just it's it's nuts here. Right, it hasn't taken into recession here, right? So we yeah, like across the board, yeah, because right. we because yeah. we're spending. So it's just it's it's yeah, it's 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 mental, <laughs> it's mental. Dave, you want to jump in or uh, yeah, Jared, you're muted. I mean, look, it, look, look. It, it, the, the the simple fact is that when you inflate the money supply and you financialize the economy, you create massive tailwinds towards wealth inequality because the rich literally get richer and everybody else finds it more difficult in that environment models which assume kind of which don't assume that happening are going to be flawed and and, and that's what we're seeing you know at the, the the fed i've said this many times on this show and i will continue to say it the thing they care about is they look at the 10 year rate. And while Mike is correct, the fact that we have a higher 10 year rate than Greece does is, I mean, I can't come up with a better word than insane, but, I, but, but there's a, but there's a reason for it. It's not insane in the sense it's like, it's totally understandable, but why it's because the drachma or the Euro are, is not the reserve. There is no drachma anymore. It's part of the euro, but it, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and therefore we pay for that by paying a bit more. You know, we have to pay a bit higher interest rate for it. The people are watching what we're doing, and you know, the other currencies kind of snake by because Germany has a lower inflation rate, lower budget deficits than we do, and Greece and Italy are along for the ride. The UK. As a situation, not the reserve currency, but their rates are almost the same exactly as ours, and their inflation is higher. 
and they're they're struggling also. So when you look at rates, you have to be cognizant of, of what you're comparing. The fact is Germany deserves to be at a lower rate than us because they have much lower debt to GDP, et cetera. Government's not quite as insane as ours in terms of spending, but we are literally in peacetime in, in what looks to be a good economy or at least a non-recessionary economy at, forget records, it's like we are literally injecting, you know, what, a trillion dollars every hundred days into the economy? And, and what do you, where do you think that money's going? Well, the money will always go to the places where the money is wanted. I mean, even in the, in the crypto world, I was looking today at funding rates and I love watching, I love reading this. I try to have to find the tab, but you know, CoinGlass has, you know, the highest funding rates and the lowest funding rates. So funding rates are about 0.025, which is like two and a half times, neutral. you know, a we don't neutral, but still, you know, a, a third of where it was last week. The highest funding rate on Bybit is from Slurf. Now, if you're saying Slurf, where have I heard that before? Slurf is the meme coin that some numb nuts burned $10 million accidentally this morning. So people are lining up to short the thing and therefore they're paying a higher funding rate. So, I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is literally the crap that's going on. I mean, I, I've seen tweets from people saying, of course, meme coins are going up because you don't need to buy them on Coinbase or Robinhood so they can't turn off the buy button because you're buying it on DeFi. I mean, literally, this is the nonsense that's going on in crypto. But if you need to understand on the macro side what's happening is we are literally flooding the economy, the global economy, with a trillion new dollars every hundred days. And so, yeah, the Fed could charge, you know, keep interest rates high. But do people really care when you're putting that much liquidity in? Particularly when the people, when you look at it, the bond market clearly cares a little. I mean, the 10 year is back at what, a little over 4.3. I mean, there's no doubt that the government would prefer it to be down below four. I mean, Mike, you were calling for it to go well below four a few weeks ago because it looked like it was going to, but I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it, that that's really where the action is. And look, if it gets back up toward five again, there's gonna be panic and they will, they will do whatever they can. And, it, it, and, and, and what's interesting, and I'd love to hear your, your, your both of you, is if the long bond starts going up, the 10 year starts going toward five, is the best move to make it to go lower, cut or raise? And I don't know the answer. And, and it's an interesting yeah. question. That's why I'm curious what you guys yeah. think. Before we jump to Mike, I just want to say the very fact that you can trade something called Slurp that was probably created this week with leverage on a centralized exchange is highly problematic and is the problem with this market. Uh, and you know, and you shouldn't be able to trade something that uh, varies thirty to fifty percent in price any given hour with with high leverage uh, anywhere, right? It just shouldn't shouldn't I mean, exist. And uh, that's that's I'm not saying that's necessarily unique. To, it is somewhat unique to us. And frankly, all this froth and stuff, it's had me selling a lot of things that are way up. Like uh, you you have to take profit in these markets. I own so many altcoins. Some of these things go up three, four, five x in a matter of month. They might go up another five or 10 times. I literally don't care. Like well, you take profit well, when the profits are given. I'm not selling Bitcoin, I do, I do, but there's a hell of a lot of other I assets. Do want, I do want market. to comment on that. I mean, I, I don't hold any of that stuff because my company facilitates uh, active traders trading this stuff. And I can tell you that the volumes going through coin routes are breaking records month over month over month because we're adding you know, pretty much anyone who trades with the amount you trade, Scott, we're, we're, you know, I've announced before that we're collecting games for a beta that we're going to launch for individuals. I know how much we can save people when trading, but because of that, I don't want anyone to accuse me of trading on the back of what our clients are doing. Uh, sorry, I see there's a lot of people who I know here. <laughs> it's waving <laughs> people that but, go by at the but, conference. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the, the, the point that I was trying to get at here is it's really a tale of two markets, right? And you see a lot going on. I mean, who wouldn't want to trade for the gold slurp? I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I've been thinking, you know, I have a Jack Russell Terrier. I think they're cuter than Shiba Inus. Why don't we have a Jack Russell Terrier with yarmulke or, or whatever, or, or hat or, you know, booties or something and, with, and with make Beanie. a meme coin. Yes. And who knows if they can retire so, off of that. What's building coin routes? Who cares? We can make I, a meme. I got to piggyback on that a little. A little lesson I learned with, 
in the trading pits and with clients is you gotta you gotta you don't mess with the market gods if you don't give them a little bit of profits they're gonna rip your face off you, they don't need to know your position but you got to give them some you got to give them some give some money to the market particularly if you make easy money in trades is that not as trading the key thing i have to point out is i, I want to show you a chart um scott and it shows the difference between longer term positions and speculating and i mean i'm a been done both and still stick with just long-term stuff and when you're speculating and you're wrong you stop yourself out and you move on now i've done that and i and that's what this chart remind me of when james mentioned retail sales earlier if you just take retail sales in this country minus cpi this is really recessionary it's negative i mean this is the latest data i i i have to bring this up because i started publishing this chart i think it was about eight months ago and i've been wrong Stock market broke out to new highs. I was right about some of the, the commodities and gold, but look at that. I mean, that's that ain't good. Yet we also have the thing is retail sales probably the weakest ever with Fed funds still high. And at some point they're gonna go down, but that's really bad. It's just one of those things like as as um as Dave mentioned, people are using credit cards. So I want to choose one other one other chart that again, this is probably going into my file that's stuff that used to matter. Um, look, look at diesel demand, and I had to get a smile at it because diesel demand—it's the grease of the economy. I mean, everything that arrives at your home house now in a in a box, which I'll get into there, is is just collapsing. So diesel demand has never dropped or been stagnant in our database going back 50 years. It's the same level as it was in 2014 in this country. Now that's diesel. You're not replacing trucks with electric yet. I mean, maybe some of them, but one thing I also point out when I traded bonds, container boards um, were a big deal. Corrugated boxes, everything you get in Amazon now, corrugated boxes, the decline is as significant was during the great depression, stuff that used to matter. And I'm like, yeah, I'm worried that once, you know, I have these little signals that we got that little gap in the S&P 500, we're getting overdone and unemployment's ticking up. It's all different this time. That's what I look at is, sure, this is a bit of the short-term hopium trade. It was wonderful, but gosh, I sure hope all those lessons of history and all the stuff that used to matter don't matter. And that is part of the reason why gold's outperforming the S&P 500 since before hiking. And again, but if you put gold in Bitcoin, you, have to, you can't have gold anymore without Bitcoin in there. It's just the way the world's going. Yeah, I mean, I have that gold chart right here. Made a new all-time high, obviously, breaking above 2146. It's retesting a support, but gold uh, making this kind of massive move to the upside, but stock's still going up. Uh, what world do we have where everything's going but, up together? But pull pull, pull up the, the uh, newsletter again, Scott, and That's I have right, a few right. charts in there that just show the liquidity in our system and uh and you know where it's gone recently and it's just it, if you if you want to understand why we're seeing liquidity keep going down keep going down to them uh the 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 last section yeah keep going keep going okay right here up the for the first one up a little bit right there so there you've got the bloomberg financial conditions index mike know this knows this one pretty well and look look at where it is I mean, it's it, it's about as high as it's been in the last 25 years, right? It's right up there. And then you go to the next one, which is the, and this is just showing the 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 ease of liquidity, like the ease of get access of capital and go to the Goldman Sachs one. And if that goes lower, it's good. So it's not, you know, it's it's the same kind of trend. It's not quite as, uh, as extreme, but then go to the Chicago Fed financials. Uh, conditions index and look where that is it's it's clearly on a downtrend and that's why the money supply is kind of it hasn't been contracting it's kind of been a little bit expansionary you know so the the money is available uh to non uh consumers you know to consumers who aren't who aren't uh looking for credit card debt but capital is available for for companies and businesses and and uh and wealthy people yeah uh, there was another article closer to the spigot you are that that's where that's where the capital yeah and that's from. what my friends at the bank so you know all my hedge fund friends and stuff you say why do you make why do you guys make so much money because we're closer to it you know it's kind of always the answer i'm looking for the article that said that the dollar uh, reserve status was in uh in question, but I can't find it at the moment. I had it pulled up here. Yeah, I don't. I mean, yeah. I'm. I'm not. I'm not, not in question, that. but that uh, we are weakening. Let me hear yeah. because Dave had talked about this a, a bit. So what? Um, so yeah. So this is. Yeah, this is a good. This is a good question for Mike. And this is. We are seeing. Uh, you know, we're we're seeing a divergence between the gold ETFs and gold price. 
Now, maybe some of that is gold ETF money is going into Bitcoin, but the reality is who's buying that gold? Who's buying the physical gold? And it's Central it's banks. sovereigns, you know, it's 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 not it's it's not investors, it's sovereigns around the world. And so is that impacting the, the US dollar yet? No, but they they want to hold gold. Why do they want to hold gold? Because they know our their that our inflation is sticky and they want to have something that will retain their purchasing power. They know that U.S. Treasuries won't. They hold treasuries because they need dollars, not because they want to, you know, um, hold their money in, in, in an asset or a security that can retain its value, retain its purchasing power. That's why they buy gold. It's, it's three reasons, China, China, and China. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, and you, you nailed it, but it's, I, I, read, I enjoyed reading the Bloomberg article this morning about how Chinese citizens are now buying gold beans. So, you know, it's like, they have to pay like a 10, 20% premium, but they want anything but what buying they're getting. Gold, and gold what? Like these jars of these gold beans, uh, wow. little little gold beans. You can, yeah, and, you know, it makes sense because they, their economy's imploding and it's just not, known yet i mean it's not widely known yet but you have to look at more anecdotal but i i love that i want to go to the dollar once a little bit because you pointed out how the u.s is 100 basis points above the top four other four countries in the world in terms of their 10-year note yields i mean that's somewhat unstoppable yes we have a debt to gdp problem but we'll hash it out i mean imagine it, you have much higher debt to gdp in china and japan and Japan might hash it out, but China, no, it's all President Z. But I want to show, uh, I got to show one thing. When people talk about the dollar, if you can show this chart, this is just a typical coinmarketcap.com. And I had a conversation with, that's one thing I enjoy being in the con, in my condos. I meet a lot of very wealthy, somewhat retired people. And I have these conversations. A lot of them are the Western elite. I want to say, well, there's one thing that matters. It's just sort of volume. The number one trade of crypto is Tether, and it's double the volume on go on Bitcoin on a typical ba basis, typical day. That's just an unstoppable force of technology. The world didn't have to go to the, they could have gone to the yen. And it owns one. treasuries, right? And, so, and, and it owns treasuries. Yeah. And so I look at this as, okay, the U.S. Um, it did like Churchill said, we came to the right conclusion. We're still beating each other. I, I just want to, I don't want to say that woman's name, but if I mention Elizabeth Warren, Dave's going to just give us fire up on it. That she has her own coin now. She has her own coin. Horace that's, Elizabeth that's Horan. The yes. That's the point about this technology is most people don't get how significant it is. And if you can't have a, a, a view in gold without thinking about cryptos, you can't have a view in a dollar without thinking about cryptos because the world's gone to the dollar. Why? Because it's the least worse. You got to have a currency to knock around every day. It's never going to be Bitcoin. And then you have to have stores of value. You can hold and transmit and transact and transport value. That's gold and Bitcoin. And then there's the stock market. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, take I mean on this point, Mike and I agree completely. The, the, the funniest thing about Liz and it is, I mean, I, it, look, we're, we're faced with a simple situation. Either she's a lot dumber than we all thought she was, which I don't think is the case, or she just has an agenda and is pushing it and, and is, the cognitive dissonance is overwhelming. Now, whenever I say cognitive dissonance, just for those who because I haven't talked about it in a while, uh, that's the tendency of the human brain when confronted with the information that you are wrong uh, to justify why you are right. Uh, there's lots of famous examples of this, but you know, effectively what it does is it causes you to twist logic, pervert it, and effectively be dumb. My favorite example of this is, a, a, is the, the Chevy Nova, which is a, was in, the, in the 70s was a, the most popular compact car in America at one point. And the marketing team tried to sell the Chevy Nova in Mexico. Uh, and there were three, two Spanish speakers evidently on the team, neither one of which were willing to, to argue with the, the, the senior people. Of course, anyone who knows Spanish knows Nova literally means no go. They tried to sell a car in Mexico called the no go. Not very smart, but they did it because they convinced themselves that they must have been right. Well, Elizabeth Warren trying to fight the stable coin bills and literally having Maxine Waters pull the plug on a stablecoin bill that was bipartisan and agreed to in committee was because she was like, oh, no, we can't allow stablecoin legislation because that'll legitimize crypto. And I can't have that because it'll make my anti-crypto army just look stupid. Except now that Tether is one of the largest holders of treasuries and bigger than most countries, actually. Now they kind of know, you know what? We really do need regulation. We do want people as Mike says, to, to make the dollar more firmly entrenched in the, the emerging crypto economy by, by legitimizing stablecoins, she'll be the last one to, to give in. 
but it feels like like that actually is a real chance of passing because it is bipartisan. It's just the extreme lunatic fringe on the left from Elizabeth Warren that's the only ones who are saying no to it. And so that really does matter because what happens if that gets legitimized? Well, then all of a sudden, now we have some legitimiz legitimization of crypto. Does that mean that, that the government's going to support meme coins? Of course not. You know, but it does make it much easier to contemplate legit regulation and legit uh, and, and helping, you know, promote an economy that has all sorts of reasons that we want to promote. And we talk about that on other spaces. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But stable coins are one of those things where only a fool looks at what's going on today and says, oh, I want to block stable coins in the U.S. because we don't want the dollar to be the currency of crypto. Yet that is literally Elizabeth Warren's position that she has had, and she made the Biden administration pull the plug last summer. And the rumors are that the people, the staffers at least, have figured out how dumb that is. Can, can I kind of piggyback on that? Oh, go ahead, Dave, James. Go ahead. No, no. I mean, it's a, it, look, they're just a super short term view. It, it's a four year cycle. They're buying votes. She's she's appealing to what she believes her constituents want and that she's the you know, she's the champion for the little person. And uh, and she's going to protect people. It's it's a, it's a, it's ludicrous. You know, this none of her her intent or policy has anything to do with the good of America it has everything to do with whether or not she gets reelected. There you go. Well, what's that? Let's piggyback on those comments and, and to the massive, overwhelming, big picture macro. What you just said, Dave um, and James, and mainly James about Nova. We, I grew up with that. I remember having not a driving one, didn't have one, but it's it's when you have an autocratic leader like you have with Z and and Mr. Putin, both presidents. You can, they cannot, it's impossible for them to get proper information because anybody below them or around them knows if they don't say the right thing, they will die or something bad will happen. It's just the way things happen. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it, yeah, it's an exponential form of when you're in a boardroom. Like you're, I mean, I've yeah. sat on these, uh, on these, yeah. um, you know, investment committees. And if you, yeah. for God, God forbid, you say something the managing partner doesn't like. He's going to, yeah. you know, embarrass you and, and de destroy you and, and, you know, undress you in front of everybody. That's, and so that's you don't want to do that. Yeah. That's and my so exact example from corporate America. Yeah. Uh, same, same exact examples. So I want to point out this is the thing that I was at the uh, at the Greenwich Economic Forum um, last week on Thursday in Miami. And, and we had a discussion, having a discussion about China. And some of those guys were bullish China. I'm like, you're missing the point. One key thing, oh, how China was bullish. China's overdue for a tradable bounce. So just look at the the Hong Kong Shanghai High Index, the lowest in, since 1975 or so, since the S&P 500. But look at the macro. This unlimited friendship completely shifted the global world order. Before we had some bad guys, Russia we could do business with, North Korea they're kind of dicey, Iran was kind of dicey. Now it completely solidified the axis of four bad guys. China joined Russia. North Korea and Iran, and the whole world is getting me out. That's good for gold, it's good for Bitcoin, and it's good for everything to do the US that's not that. And the question is, where does it end? And that's why I'm looking at, okay, so we have the most of the world, I'm hearing this even from Chinese investors doing everything they can to buy Qs or buy anything that US based. Um, and then you have this thing that's in the middle, Bitcoin. So to me, this is the world order that the biggest shift could be maybe, maybe, um, um, Z calls up Vlad. Hey, hey, Vlad. You know the the limited, the unlimited friendship thing. It's not working, but that is a key risk. Otherwise, this is going to continue, and that is where Bitcoin and gold come in the middle. And I don't see. To me, that's overwhelming macro and everything. That sometimes paradigm shifts that this significant, you don't notice when you're right in the middle. And that to me is the major thing that's changing the world. Yeah, it's super we have cool. a number of sort of. Oh, I, I think I brought yours up. Let me bring mine up. We have a couple. James, if you want to piggyback, you can go ahead, and then I'll, I'll jump to something else. I just wanted to talk about Bitcoin. Obviously, trading around sixty-eight thousand ish right now. We saw a top near seventy-four thousand. Of course, anytime it drops a few percent, that means it's over. It's dead. It's going to zero, right? Um, but we have still the sort of hyperbolic or larger well, targets. Yeah. I don't think 80,000. When we've gone to 74,000, I don't think the Biden CEO is saying 80,000 is a wild prediction. But of course, we have Standard Charter now saying 150 this year, 250 so, next year. I mean, are we exhausted with the pr predictions yet? No. And well, I was going to say um, about what Mike was saying with uh, with Bitcoin and gold and Bitcoin's price. Look, Bitcoin, it, we 
it's in a it's kind of got a new dynamic not kind of it absolutely has a massive new dynamic and that's the ability for institutions and registered investment advisors to buy it through ETFs and and for people put in their IRAs it's very simple now and it's and it's actually super accessible for people like I want to own some exposure to Bitcoin oh I don't have to pay seventy thousand dollars for a coin I can pay you know fifty dollars for one of these ETFs and it, it's a it's a major mental hurdle for them to get over and so this is this is a really big deal but you know I I don't know what you guys have, have been hearing but there there were a lot of there was a lot of talk around the street and I've been watching MicroStrategy. I've, I've owned MicroStrategy in my hedge fund. And, you know, um, I've been watching this, uh, the premium of MicroStrategy of the underlying Bitcoin it owns versus the, the stock out. share price. And it's, and it's, it's gone to, yeah, it's, it's just stored. And so the rumor is on, on Friday, and I have not had this confirmed yet. I just want to make this very clear. I've not had this confirmed, but it would make sense to me. And I think Mike and Dave will, will um, I want to hear what they have to say, but it would make sense to me that there was a very large hedge fund who was doing the pairs trade, long Bitcoin, yeah. short micro strategy, and got bought in because they they uh, they they tripped their limit on the margin on the short side because micro strategy has blown up so uh, so dramatically versus the, versus Bitcoin on a you know on an underlying value basis and so that spread blew out and a, and a major hedge fund had to blow out of that trade. What does that mean? That means they had to buy in their micro strategy and sell the Bitcoin. Uh, and just and they got they they basically got liquidated like we've talked about with large margin trades. So that's, doesn't that mean that doesn't that mean that micro strategy should either drop or Bitcoin should now rise to meet should, somewhere in the middle? Revert to the mean of a trade. Yeah, it should it, revert it, to the mean. You know, um, and if it doesn't, if I'm Michael, I'm 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 selling more stock. I'm selling more bonds. I'm 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 continuing to to add Bitcoin to my sheet. If the people want to pay me to do that, of course I'm going to do that. That, and to be honest, me... James, if you're looking at what uh, Sailor did over the last two weeks, I mean, the 800 million convertible note and then, and then another 48 hours yeah, later, yeah. a 500, that that would indicate that uh, he was aware that uh, MicroStrategy's price was flying for a reason that was not necessarily fundamental, perhaps technical, and that that was another opportunity to catch that mean reversion. And he saw this a million miles away. Like I, I, I when you talk to Michael Sailor, like I personally struggle to keep up mentally. He is so, I have no he idea is what so he's talking fast. about. Yeah. It's like I'm I'm I feel like I'm 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 working at keeping up just to follow everything he's saying because he see and his mind is clocking so quickly. Like he, this is not this is child's play to him. He's like, sure, I'll do more. You know, like he's not even he's got it all lined up and he's ready to go. So I, I gotta piggyback on that one. So the first coming out global um, thing we, Bloomberg did in 2022 was in Miami and I had the honor of it was me and Michael Strat me and uh, Michael Sailor in a room I was and, there. Yeah, yeah Scott you were there that's right we had drinks after we're great and it was like the first big one that Bloomberg sponsored and he's the best person in the world to interview because I don't want to say anything. <laughs> it's just, it's there and Ask just like, one question. You let him talk for an hour. Yeah. And it's like the history is awesome. So I had to show you the one chart because I think um, James um, and Dave, Dave probably thinks the first thing I, when I see a chart like this, I'm like, okay, I know for sure having covered these customers and have been squeezed myself is classic. There's someone getting squeezed on that short. And we might hear the story, the story later, but this is a long-term chart. It's in log. Microsoft strategy is a good history of pumping and dumping. I mean, it's been higher than it is now. It was up at 3,000 uh, in 2000, and it dropped to, what, five? Yeah, I don't know why your chart <laughs> shows that, because this it, it was uh, 1315. It hit a high here of uh, 1800, 1800 or so. So that should be higher, I think, on the right. Well, right, it's the current price now, 16. Because gotcha. uh, yeah. it just says, it's just so, yeah, I can narrow it's it down. It's a long-term log chart, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Just, but yeah. it just, I want to show you the history of that. So, um, yeah, the first thing, I when I see a chart, like it's like yeah but here's a lesson i learned in the trading with clients is when i can't feel sorry for people to take excessive leverage and get and get hammered it's just welcome to the world of the big boys <laughs> yeah exactly i mean we saw it long-term capital management and we all experienced yeah. it and how painful that was you know, I experienced it. Well, we experienced it in in the in the tech bubble a 2000 tech bubble you know i mean i had a hedge fund you know a, a, somebody a partner in my firm who 
shorted Amazon right through the top and got his absolutely got his face ripped off because he was adamant that nobody was going to buy things online. They're not going to put their credit card online. And <laughs> he was wrong. You know, he was painfully. I mean, it was it was it was almost excruciating to watch. We were begging him to just stop out his trade and got his face ripped off. And you I, just one, one thing I have to mention, and we got to pass it, David. I've had two fathers of sons ask me. I, this is a sh most I never who are generally well off who own MicroStrategy and they're worried that their sons own this stock and it's going up a lot. I'm like, what's well, a good problem? They're making a lot of money, but I've never had that happen with something like that. Two different <laughs> people in different parts of the world. Yeah, and I'm not saying anything fundamentally. Micro MicroStrategy has got a he's got an incredible strategy. What he's doing is is it's, it's brilliant. It's gotten ahead of itself, in my opinion, and I think he knows that. And uh, and obviously, like you said, Mike, somebody got somebody got squeezed. And I think going bring it full circle back to what Scott was saying. I think that is where that that sell pressure was coming from late last week. But let's face it, this is actually healthy. You know, it's not healthy for a stock to just go straight up every single day for a security, for a store value, anything to go up every single day. It's not healthy. So to have a pullback for a few days, that's good. It's a pause. It gives everybody time to, you know, sort out their books, figure out exactly where they are. And uh, and, it, and it forms a base of, of uh, support where where you have managers and come in and say, OK, it, it, this is a really good spot to come in again. And then, you know, uh, you can you can continue on your merry way. Dave, you're up. So a couple of things. First, on MicroStrategy, I've seen some reasonable analysis which says that we're not even close to uh, the highest leverage or the highest premium because when you take into account how much more he's been buying, uh, understand that in some sense he's taken a, 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 a you know, he's basically, you know, imitation from serious form of flattery. If you go back in the history of Amazon, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's what I was thinking of. Bezos, by knowing, by taking advantage of the fact that Amazon had high volatility, was able to get incredibly cheap financing by selling convertible notes. Well, Sailor's doing exactly the same thing. So he's getting incredibly cheap financing to buy Bitcoin every time he does this. And so the premium is actually less than people think. And if you short it, assuming it's a static thing, like a closed end fund, of course, you deserve to get your face ripped off. And any hedge fund that did that, that's Darwinism. Because, you know, you know, if you ever read the Darwin Awards, that's the financial equivalent of the Darwin Awards. And he's a Darwin Award winner for being dumb, assuming that sailors could not continue to buy more uh, on effectively by selling the volatility in his own stock, which is what he's doing, which is freaking brilliant. And... The, the hedge fund manager on the side is obviously as dumb as the idiots that were portrayed in uh, in, 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 in in the in the dumb money movie, uh, you know whatever the, you know whatever. The, I forgot the guy who Jonah Hill played, yeah. but he got what he deserved, and there you go. So uh, yeah, Seth Rogen, the, the guy from Melvin Capital, so yeah, Seth, Seth Rogen, Rogen right, yeah, right, from, from Seth Rogen. No, yeah. I was I don't know why I always get those two actors confused. I, I love Ken Griffin and Stevie Cohen in that movie. By the way, they were both perfect. Well, but both it. of them were portrayed inaccurately. Uh, <laughs> of course, they, they were for both portrayed inaccurately in the movie. From what I've been told, the 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 Melvin Capital guy that was pretty accurate, and you know that's Darwinism too. It's like. You had, you had everything and you lost it all because you were a schmuck and you bet more than you could afford to lose, which is always the, the anyone in a hedge fund by definition should never do that. He did it. Well, there you go. Capital goes. But the good news is the good people. news is that uh, Melvin Capital had Citadel to throw in three billion at the end and turn off the buy button. So, uh, you know, it worked out all right. <laughs> Although Melvin did end up closing I, down. <laughs> I will tell, I will tell you that I, do not believe that is true. Well, the three billion capital, yes. Yeah. The turning off the buy button, I will go to my grave not believing they did that because I know the people at Citadel Securities. Many of them are my friends. It was Robinhood. Robinhood had to because they couldn't cover the orders. I, yeah, it wasn't. I don't think. What that happened that was, was, what happened was somebody persuaded DTCC to put the, the screws to Robinhood. That had nothing, in, it, it, and whoever that was was, I don't know, but we'll never know that. But it, I don't think it's who we think it is. is yeah. But that's a totally, like, we're, we're way off topic. Yeah, the, go ahead. The, the important topic here, though, is, is Bitcoin 
And we've seen this movie before. Every time Bitcoin goes on an epic bull run, before that, there's somewhere anywhere from three weeks to six weeks to nine weeks to 12 weeks of sitting in a range for the spring to coil. So most of us kind of think the idea is sit in a range for the spring to coil and let price discovery happen. What you're seeing now is class is different than in the past stuff. Every other time before this, we saw that. It was the hot money rotates out, the hodlers stay, and the price kind of drifts lower with not a whole lot of buying interest. Now we're seeing people taking profit and to even stronger hands, namely, you know, the investors that are starting their allocations. And that's a big difference. That means that whatever happens when we get to the end of the this particular range will be stronger than you expect because the, the hot money's already out. And, and buy, you know, then all right. of a sudden, yeah. and, and the FOMO will start after we start running out of supply to sell to the people who are generally accumulating. Yeah, but and what's, so what's important about difference. that, Dave, is that it's not just FOMO. It's it's literally just we're, we're onboarding we're onboarding institutions. And they're like, well, we need to own some. And that they don't care. Right. Like, well, That's my point. Them. Yeah. I, I guess I wasn't clear. None of this is FOMO. We haven't even yeah. sniffed FOMO yet. Exactly. We haven't even yeah. sniffed exactly. people thinking about FOMO yet. This is the, the crypto. Wait, the crypto DJs. The crypto DGENs are FOMOing. We just haven't seen institutions and retail FOMOing, to be clear. Because no, what's but crypto happening DGENs in are coins, FOMOing. Yeah. But, what's, but they're what's, not FOMOing into Bitcoin. They're I FOMOing agree. into totally, Bitcoin totally separate market. They're in the casino. Yeah. yeah but, they're, but, they're over in the right. casino having their own party. Right. Well, right. one thing right. that's, right. that's I, I think it's clearly reiterated this weekend was this is the number one risk asset traded on a 24 basis everywhere i mean there's just so many bots and algos trading in this and making a killing and some are getting hurt the high on saturday was 70 the low on sunday was 64. i mean that's just a wonderful environment for traders where i came from where you always have to get stopped out I you love have to it. we have a, i mean there's there's, there's machines have, trading this 24 7. Yeah, I almost tweeted last night. I I have bids way down on a ladder, you know. Like I got there hit go. over the weekend. I'm like, that's great. I bought it. Yeah, the best the best trades right. always happen when you're sleeping, right? The ones that you, you set know? and forget and about, you, and then all of a sudden you yeah, wake up and you're filled. You can do that as a hedge fund. You can do that as a as an here's a stack. Fund, you for you guys. You've got to buy the ETF, so they're out buying it this morning at a higher price. But as yeah. a hedge fund, you can buy it. I'm sorry, Mike. So, I, so here's I, a I interrupted good. you. I, I want your anecdote is great. You're in the in the markets doing it. You're one of the people I just expect is doing it. Dave. So here's 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 this here's some data for you. Over basically over the last year, uh, Coin Routes clients traded on the weekend. So maybe our average on an entirety of weekend, Saturday and Sunday, uh, based on UTC, maybe we would have averaged over the past year somewhere between uh, 150, you know, somewhere around $150 million in the platform on the weekend. During September, it was probably lucky on the weekend to get 100. You know, it would spike up. We'd get, we'd get some two or 300 million weekends. This weekend, this weekend, our clients traded $850 million to our platform. Weekend. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you, if, if you want to understand how much motion is wow. going on, that is apart from and when you see these sorts of moves on the weekend, you know, Mike Alfred made the comment, well, Bitcoin's, you know, low volume falls are going to be reversed. And while I agreed with them, I was kind of scratching my head at low volume. I think what he meant to say is low participation. Right. But you can still get stuff done. And, you know, it's, it's significant. And so Mike is right. You know, the, this things that are happening are right now is there's much more interest there's much more brownie in motion in the marketplace full stop mike can i ask you if there's any risk to what sailor is doing people love right now by the way to uh point to the hunt brothers you know anyone who doesn't know the history obviously of silver they oh. use my leverage to basically get 25 percent of the uh of the supply of silver people are saying that's what sailor's doing dude it's one percent the, it's not you only can't that but they compare the two you can't compare but, it to you. But silver, you, can, you can mine was, silver to no end. There's yeah. no end to it. Go ahead, Dave. I'm just curious you know, if there I, is I, risk to what, this, to, to what sailors do. 
Can, can I please answer this? Because please. I actually yeah. wrote a tweet storm on this when I first saw it. Whoever said this is a moron, okay? <laughs> first of all, two things. Silver, the convention in the silver pits in futures, even though at the time you were allowed to ask for delivery, nobody did, okay? So silver was heavily financialized. Almost certainly people were shorting silver that had no ability, intention, or even okay. thought that they might ever have to actually accumulate silver. They, if they were wrong, they would just settle off the spot price. What the Hunt brothers re realized was the first version, first example that I, I've seen in my professional career, although it was a little bit before me, I was in college at the time, of what we call liquidity arbitrage. And we've seen this now play out since then. They said, hmm, I can buy physical silver, make it very hard to find, and now I could go and demand that people deliver to me and they won't be able to, so they'll have to go buy silver, and there really isn't a very large silver spot market because the futures market was much larger than the silver spot market. Those dynamics do not exist in Bitcoin. Bitcoin tracks the spot price with immediate liquidations in the futures market uh, outside of the CME. And the, the borrow market in Bitcoin is very well established. You can see how hard it is to buy. You can see where it goes. It's incredibly obvious. So even if he were 25 times larger than he was, it still wouldn't be the same kind of thing that the Hunt brothers did. Okay, I'll stop ranting and let Mike talk now. No, but yeah, you're, Mike. It, it, it's a great rant. Here was my take on it is when I first heard him, I think it was 2020, and he referenced a bridge built in Rome, uh, in, in Italy uh, by the Romans 2,000 years ago. Mike, you got me. <laughs> I'm such a sucker for history. And I think what's happening in this space, and part of the reason I it, that helped uh, take me really bullish Bitcoin then, and I actually bought some MicroStrategy and never touched it. It's what we do here is I just don't even want to look at it, a small amount. And I, I looked at it like, okay, there's a certain risk you want to take in life. This is guys doing something, something completely revolutionary. Dave and James, you might have to come back something where he's actually taking his company that we know if you follow the rules of Jeff Booth and the price of tomorrow is probably going to be faded away. Technology is moving so fast and converting over to something I've never seen before. And he's been able to do it and he convinced his board to do it. And I'm like, okay, well, um, and I'm sure there are some hedge funds who got caught the wrong way and bought the new ETFs and it didn't work out the right way. But I look at this as a stock that's like, yeah, I fully agree with what's happening with the technology as I show in the dollar. The world has just seen a new newer technology and something that's we've never had before. And he's willing to take risk on it um, in a big way. And I figure, okay, well, might as well have some of that. And I think that's what I see in my, it's that unique of something's has this kind of thing. I'm sure someone can dig in say something like this has ever happened, has happened before, but not with, a digital asset in the world going digital and being able to hold this asset with limited supply, increasing demand and being part of it. It's just like, okay, well, I think most people are saying, okay, what's the risk is not having some of it through his, through his stock market, his, his company, the way he's doing it. And he's, he's leveraging it and he's getting in and borrowing cheap and people letting him do it. And okay. In the worst case, you get stopped out. So make sure you don't have too much money in the trade. <laughs> it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant trade. It's a brilliant strategy. It's not even a trade for him. It's a, just a long-term strategy. It's, yeah. it's, it's smart. He does what he, he says. The only thing I'll add, years. the only thing I'll add is consider, just like people talk about the National Football League or any other league, whatever a team does that wins the Super Bowl, it's a copycat league. Now yeah. consider that FASB has changed and effective now, this year, every company can hold bitcoin in their balance sheet and get credit in their accounting for gains if you think there will not be others who are looking to do the same thing or at least some shadow of the same thing then there's a bridge that i used to be able to see from my old apartment in new york <laughs> that i'd love to sell you well it's like what's the number one rule of a politician number one rule is to get reelected. what's the number one rule most time of a lot of People who run companies now has increased the share price. Well, he proved there's a good way to do that other than buybacks and being a good manager. I mean, I'm not saying he's a bad manager, but um, this is another way to boost the stock price. And he's just did it in, in a big way. Yeah, <laughs> big way. It, it's, it's impressive. I just always assume there has to be some guy risk. Right before we go, I just want to show you guys how awesome the Chevy Nova was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nice. I think it was awesome. So I, so I worked at a gas station. I do remember doing oil changes on these things, and that really inspired me to go to college and study real hard. They don't know what they, <laughs> they, they don't know what they were missing in Mexico just because of the name. That's all I'm going to say. That car was that car was awesome, guys. This is an amazing episode. Absolutely love it, Dave. Thanks for uh, 
finding a corner in the Hilton. It seems one of us finds a corner at least once a month uh, to, to, to film these last week. It was me. Uh, always love this. It's my favorite hour conversation. Guys, please follow James, Mike, Dave uh, on X. The links are right down below. James, we highly featured your, your newsletter here. Everybody should absolutely Thanks. subscribe. I assume that it's below, but the link is on your Twitter as well, right? Yep. Yeah. So you guys should all be doing that. And uh, I got to run. We got uh, Twitter spaces, X spaces in 13 minutes. And uh guess the party keeps on going, guys. Thank you so much. I will see you all next week. Bye. That's dope.